I've always had a soft spot for a good concept car. More often than not, these cars push the limits of engineering, power, and styling for the time, all in an attempt to promote branding. It's cool to see what designers working at these auto manufacturers come up with when given freedom and are not constrained by rules and regulations. In this series of videos, I'm going to list my top concept cars from individual manufacturers. I'm sure you're going to disagree with me on more than one of these, so let me know what your favorites are in the comments section. Number five on my list, the Dodge Fire Arrow series. The Dodge Fire Arrow series has to be some of the most beautifully designed cars ever built by Dodge. Maybe even by the big three automakers. And it's no wonder why, given that Virgil Exner is responsible for all four of them. Looking to build a roadster that can compete with the likes of Chevy Corvette and the Ford Thunderbird, Virgil designed four of the most beautifully built cars between 1953 and 1954. The first Dodge Fire Arrow was a beautiful two-seat roadster convertible with a curved frameless windshield. It was manufactured by Ghia and was just a dummy car with no powertrain. But it was an amazing two-seat roadster that pushed the limits of Dodge styling. It now resides at the Peterson Museum. Dodge quickly followed up with the Fire Arrow 2, but this time Dodge dropped a 241 cubic inch Red Ram Hemi that made 150 horsepower. The bumper and grille was revised, it went from four to two headlights and maintained its frameless curved windshield and convertible roof. The Fire Arrow 2 was the last sold at Mecham Auction in 2019 with the Fire Arrow 4, which we'll get into a bit. By 1954, the Detroit Auto Show rolled around. Dodge brought out the Fire Arrow 3 Sport Coupe. Sporting Opel Blue, it got a wide open mouth grille and went back to four headlights. The car just got even more beautiful in my opinion. The Little Red Ram Heavy helped driver Betty Skelton set a women's speed record of 143.44 mile per hour at Chrysler's track. Last I heard, famed car collector Joe Burtz pushed, purchased the Fire Arrow 3 from France and has restored it. The Fire Arrow 4 took design cues from the Fire Arrow 3 coupe, except it went back to its convertible roots. Now sporting red with black and white diamond pattern interior, the windshield was framed in this time and the grille was different, but it was still powered by the same Red Ram Heavy that pushed the car to a speedy 143 miles per hour. The Fire Arrow 4 was a full-fledged ready production car that was ready to be built fully road legal. But for whatever reason, Dodge and Chrysler never went ahead with it. A limited run of 177 cars based off the design was made by a small automaker called Dual Gia, mainly for celebrities, but in my opinion, it just wasn't as nice. Next on my list at number four is the Dodge Zio or zero emissions operation. Now I know some of you guys are gonna say, Vic, we don't care about electric cars. Well, too bad, because I think this next one's pretty cool and a huge missed opportunity for Dodge and Chrysler. Look at gas prices right now. Where could they be if they built this car? This two plus two compact five door wagon made its appearance at the 2008 Detroit Auto Show, sporting a 200 kilowatt electric motor that made 268 horsepower on an all aluminum frame this lightweight electric rocket could hit 0 to 60 in 5.7 seconds and had a 250 mile or 400 kilometer range according to Dodge engineers. The Zio was actually a pretty cool sporty looking electric car for the time. It had a low wide aggressive stance, massive curved windshield that gives the driver and passengers a 360 degree view, and cool scissor doors that open up to an interior that even by today's standards looks pretty damn nice. The Zio was supposed to show that electric cars didn't have to be boring, bland, lifeless cars like a Toyota Prius, and I think it did just that. There was even plans to build a plug-in hybrid version. The plug-in hybrid version would have had a 40 kilometer electric range, similar to like the way these plug-in hybrids are now, and was going to be backed by either a 5.7 or a 6.1 liter Hemi. How fun would that be to drive right now with current gas prices? Do your 40 kilometer little putting around town, and then you get to bury the Hemi on the highway. So what happened to the Zio? Well, it actually looked like Daimler Chrysler had a plan to produce the Dodge Zio. Plans were to outsource most of its productions, but no partners were chosen. But unfortunately, by 2009, Chrysler was in bankruptcy again and was purchased by Fiat, 
who disbanded the division responsible for the electric vehicle development within Chrysler. I just can't help but think, what would the electric car market be like if Dodge had actually built the Zio? All right, so this one at number three is kind of a two for one deal really. In late 1969, when the 1970 models were being produced, the 22nd car to roll off the assembly line would be a million dollar car today. A black 1970 Hemi four-speed convertible Challenger with a Dana and 410 gears. But not just any Hemi convertible Challenger, as if that wouldn't be rare enough. It was the most highly optioned Challenger ever built with power windows and the first Mopar with a shaker hood. But this car was destined for even greater things. The Challenger was pulled off the assembly line by Chrysler executives and sent to Syntax Incorporated, a custom car builder in Dearborn where it was painted honey gold and given side pipes, converted to a two-seater with a target top. The purpose of this experiment was to test the possibility of building something to compete with the Chevy Corvette once again. But its reception was, well, let's just say it was reported that people were more interested in leaving their mark with marker on the model than the car itself. Beat it, boys. You bother me. Back to the drawing board, the car was sent back to Syntax, where it was converted to what we now know as the Diamante, which means diamond in Spanish. The shaker hood was gone, replaced with a long sloping hood into a pointed nose with flip-up lights, paying homage to the Daytona Charger and Superbird. It was given wide fenders and turbine wheels, Ready in time for the 1971 Detroit Auto Show, the Diamante was a hit. It probably didn't hurt that Chrysler ditched the model for what was reported to be a million dollars worth of diamonds that surrounded the car instead this time. Apparently, after the first show, the car was so badly scratched while being loaded into a transporter that it was quickly sent off to be painted before the next show. To the surprise of Chrysler executives, the Diamond returned wearing the color tangerine orange, which was very popular for the time but not quite appropriate for a car named the Diamond. Rumor has it that the paint shop owner was not a fan of white cars and took it upon himself to repaint it a color he liked. The car remained popular and was shown until 1974 when the E-body line was discontinued. Fast forward a few years, Chrysler's in financial trouble. The warehouse that stores their cars wants their money and Chrysler tells them to sell the cars to pay the bill. The Diamante changes hands a few times and ends up in the collection of Steve Juliano, who returned the car to its white glory. But unfortunately, Mr. Juliano passed away in 2018. Many of his cars from his extensive collection have already gone up for auction. But as for the Diamante, I have yet to find out what happened to it. For the number one vehicle, I bounce back and forth between these next two. In my opinion, both are amazing feats of engineering, really cool looking vehicles. And I just finally decided that coming in at number two, built like a motorcycle, but with four wheels, is it a motorcycle? Is it a car? Who the hell knows in all of honesty, but the Dodge Tomahawk is probably the craziest vehicle to come out of the minds of Dodge engineers. Its retro 30 style Art Deco design, coupled with an 8.3 liter V10, making 500 horsepower and 525 foot pounds of torque, give it a blend of classic, futuristic, and plain crazy all in one. How did the Tomahawk perform? All four wheels had independent suspension which allowed for 45 degree lanes in turns with all four wheels on the ground. This would allow for some decent cornering in theory, but sharp turns were apparently limited by the 18 degree handlebar turning radius. Top speed estimates were anywhere from 250 to 420 miles per hour, depending on how it was calculated. But it was never taken above 100 miles per hour. And in all honesty, who would want to sit on this 1500 pound rocket and go faster than that. Imagine dumping this thing while going 420 miles per hour. Either way, concept cars are meant to generate buzz, promote branding, and push technological limits. The Tomahawk did just that. So much so that nine people bought these non street legal machines for a cool 555,000 US dollars through the Neiman Marcus catalog. Because of its uniqueness, power, and styling, I think the Tomahawk is one of the best concept vehicles ever built by Dodge. All right, the number one car, the one we've all been waiting for. My number one Dodge concept vehicle ever built is the Dodge 
M4S, which stands for Mid-Engine Four-Cylinder Sport. Dodge and mainly head designer Bob Ackerman went off the board with this $1.5 million project built in 1981. And let's be honest, the 80s was a dark era for cars, so something like this coming out is pretty amazing. Intended to be used as a pace car for the Indy racing, the M4S was powered by a 2.2 liter four-cylinder engine. Yes, the same 2.2 that was used in the Omni, the Rampage, and the rest of Chrysler K-Car lineup. But this one was twin turbocharged and made 440 horsepower, enough to push the 2,550 pound car from zero to 60 in 4.1 seconds and set a speed record of 195 miles per hour at Moroso Motorsports Park. At the time, the M4S was the fastest four-cylinder car ever. And in all honesty, if you know a faster four-cylinder car now, let me know in the comments section because I don't know of it. If its performance factor wasn't good enough for you, its styling should be. Built like a bullet, it had scissor doors, a slick rear wing. The M4S was an aerodynamic missile with a drag coefficient of 0.236. Better than some of the supercars today, like the LaFerrari, which is 0.3. The M4S even made an appearance in the 1986 cult classic, The Wraith, starring Charlie Sheen. You ever seen one of those before? Nah, let's just add it to our collection. Six copies of this car were made, including two drivable cars powered by Volkswagen engines and four dummy cars that were destroyed. The car nearly killed a stunt driver at one point due to its insane speed. There's a kid out there using his car to kill people. Not that it's such a big deal since it seems to be your gang he's got it in for. So what happened to the cars? Well, the replica driving cars were sold off and are in private collection somewhere. One of the non-drivable cars was with Jay Leno. And as for the original, well, it was at the Chrysler Museum, which closed in 2016. But many of the cars from the old Chrysler Museum ended up at the Dodge Viper factory, which was turned into a museum itself. So if you've been and have seen the M4S, let me know in the comments section. Because I would love to know where this amazing car is right now.